On this episode of the Heartland Pod for Monday, March 4th, 2024, Missouri Senators attack an innocent man. Alabama Supreme Court race draws major money. Missouri Governor Parson plays favorites again. Starbucks unionization. Joe Manchin catches up to reality. Trump's immunity case. The 2024 election coverage era rolls on, plus a last call preview. Lots to do, so let's go. Welcome to the Heartland Pod, where we are working together to change the conversation in politics. My name is Adam Summer, and I am joined, as usual, by my Sunday cohorts and co-hosts, Rachel Parker and Sean Diller, hanging out with me on this fine, beautiful uh, Heartland Sunday morning. Uh, I have got a the remnants of eh, about a half of my second giant cup of coffee ready to go and some water on the backup. Had a good week. Uh, got over a sinus infection. Feeling good. Feeling strong. Got back on the treadmill and, uh, you know, just ready to rock and roll. Just feeling, you know, just a little bit lighter. Sean Diller, how about you? How you doing? How's the week? And uh, what you sipping on? I'm doing well. Thanks, man. The week was good. It was all kind of a blur, but we're here now. So <laughs> that's great. Um, it's funny you say about the treadmill, because just yesterday I was out in the yard with my five-year-old and uh, she like wants to play tag, you know, and obviously mm-hmm. I'm faster than a five-year-old. Like I can beat her at tag. Uh, <laughs> It's what but you like, would like to think. Right. <laughs> but as we're running around in the backyard, I'm like trying to like, you know, make it fun and interesting and doubling back, you know, so she can get close and then miss, you know. And within 90 seconds, I'm like mm-hmm. fully gassed. It's just, <laughs> okay, dad needs to lie down on the deck in the sun for 10 minutes now. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> and now it's time to play Daddy hurdles. It's a new game. <laughs> right. You just, you guys you just run back me. and forth. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we play that game. I play that game with Jane with my little list called, it's just called got you. And I just sit propped up against the couch and she just runs <laughs> the full length of the house and slams into me. <laughs> got you. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And plus you have to clean up the living room beforehand. So it's a, it's a twofer. So <laughs> really, <laughs> really good game. <laughs> Rachel Parker, how about you? How's the weekend? Uh, oh yeah. Sean, what you got? What you got some hot coffee there? Some cold coffee some yeah well i've got some hot coffee. coffee it has lactose free milk in it because i that's grabbed sad. too fast yeah so. that's unfortunate oh, that's sorry. super unfortunate i'm sorry no, that's probably fine i don't know i've never had the lactose free milk is it is it's, it i mean i usually drink not. my coffee black so i dumped a little in to try to use up the lactose free milk and i'm like okay is that first why do we have lactose free milk is that for smoothies or something or for like lactose intolerant folks it's yeah. still milk okay. it's not like oat milk is yeah. anybody tolerant yeah. To the I don't know. <laughs> Is anybody? I'd like to meet the person who's tolerant to the I lactose. Have a, I have. I have a great after thirty five. You know, I have a great. I have a really. Um, I am a fan. I wouldn't do it publicly, but I. I am a fan of like. Let's all talk about the times that we almost crapped our pants because like because it's all connected what? to lactose. Let's be honest. <laughs> it is. It's just and milk. Like, milk have, and ice cream. I have, I have one where I like. I hadn't had ice cream in like seven thousand years because I'm not a big ice cream person. And I went to Cold Stone Creamery and I was like, I'm going to treat myself because there was one I could walk to from work. And I was meeting up with a friend that night and I had to call him and be like, dude, I don't know what you have to do, but I have, when I get to your house, I have about 10 seconds. And he like, he like <laughs> held the door open downstairs and was like, go, go, go. And like all the doors are open. Anyway, yeah. yeah, I could do I could do those stories all day. We'll do those in person. We'll save those for. <laughs> Welcome to our Sunday recording of the politics. <laughs> Why not? Where, yeah. Why not? We've we've dove in straight can into I, the lactose. Well, this is huge right now. I think this counts as wellness. I think we'll so. Yeah. Does. Can I also jump before I, my week was fine? I'm sipping on what rem, the remnants of. I made espresso this morning. It's very strong, um, and it's gumming up my throat. <clears throat> but I do want to tell a story about watching a dad get gassed, which is one of our favorite stories of all time. Uh, my husband Ellie and I were still living in Los Angeles. We were walking in this park we used to go to, and this dad was uh, a, a poor Lear fellow, was um, but not notably, you know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like just sure, kind yeah. of like dad bod, just yeah. straight dad bod. Yeah. In his thirties, somewhere younger than we were, um, and he was uh, flying a kite with his uh, little tiny daughter, and the kite got out of his hands. It's a very windy day, or he wouldn't be flying a kite. Right. And he took off running after the kite to get it and it was it was a fool's errand the kite got stuck in a tree that's not what's funny what's funny is that he did not run very far right right, at all (laughs) you got to watch him like 
you know, launch and then like <laughs> lose it. <laughs> yeah, he, instantly. Hands hands on knees. Yeah. Like just gulping air. Doubled and over, the, yeah. And the 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 kicker and why and why this is a funny story is the voice behind him going, Daddy, Daddy, <laughs> can you catch it? <laughs> she can see the tree just right. like stranded in this. She can see the kite just stranded in this tree. Oh and dad's just like, I've got to go back to the gym. It was amazing. Cause she wouldn't stop. She's like, Daddy, why you not get the kite? Yeah. When you gotta get the kite, you can't even answer her. Oh, it's amazing. Kids it was will so do funny. that, man. Kids will do that. I've I took Ben out to play golf a few years ago and we went up to the tees and we went to the to the middle tees. And he was like, Why don't you use the back tees? And I was like, Well, those are for, you know, other other golfers who play a lot more and you know, blah blah blah. And, he's, and he was like, Oh, well, I saw that person hit from those tees. They must just be stronger. And I was just like, God damn it. Just cut me just right to the core. Just Son, right. No one is very, stronger than your dad. And that's yeah. a very, we need to get you a notebook. Like <laughs> right. you're very close. Uh, <laughs> just, just crazy. Uh, hey, reminder: uh, if you want to help the effort in Missouri to get the abortion petition onto the ballot, uh, check out yeah, Missourians for constitutional they, freedom. Uh, yeah, they're doing serious stuff. Yeah. Yeah, they've been they've been rocking and rolling with some like early trainings and stuff, but now it's really rolling in earnest. Yeah, it's cool. Um, if you it's haven't, really if you're in Missouri and you haven't signed up by now, you probably haven't gone anywhere. Um, I would suggest because like there people are out and about. Um, I mean, even in my small town, there's been a ton of opportunity for people to sign. Um, so take advantage of that, Missourians for constitutional freedom. You can type that right into the Google machine, and it will pop up for you. <laughs> Talking politics. All right, getting into talking politics. Just a reminder: you can support what we do by leaving a five star rating and a review wherever you listen to the show. Follow us on social media with at the Heartland Pod. Take a moment, share the show with somebody this week. Send them the link from where you listen. Just just click copy, and you can you can text it right to them. Let them know what's going on over here, especially as we get into twenty twenty four. And check us out at theheartlandcollective.com. You can find podcasts, articles. You can get signed up to be a part of our Patreon support. The podheads over there get all of the extras that come with that membership at five bucks a month and up. Five bucks a month, a cup of coffee helps us create these shows, helps defray the expense. Uh, you know, this is, we do all of this in our truly spare time with, uh, you know, our own money other than whatever you guys throw at us to help us cover the costs. So we appreciate every single member over there. And, uh, you know, at the higher levels, you can be part of this recording. So we're recording this on Sunday morning. And if you're at the higher levels, you can be here live with us if you want to or not. Or you can watch it on Patreon later because it'll be there for you to watch, but only at those higher levels. We appreciate you all very, very much. Uh, the first thing I'll just mention in the talk and politics section, I don't know if you guys saw this uh Absolutely uh, major news that Donald Trump did win the Missouri Republican caucus. So just in case you guys were curious um, as far as that outcome goes, uh, it was incredibly sparsely attended. Sean, you're from Cass County originally. There's roughly 110,000 people in Cass County. Do you know how many people attended the Cass County Republican caucus? Oh, man. Um, I'll guess 10,000. About 350. Ooh, whoa. 350 people? <laughs> people. Yikes. Wow. We need Wait, to do an episode oh, of... Okay, did go Did Missouri ahead. start doing a caucus recently? Yes. Just yes. this year. Stupidly. Just this year. Yeah, they moved yeah. to a presidential caucus. And in a, in a county of 100,000 people that voted for Donald Trump by basically 60% in the 2020 election, 350 people showed up to the caucus. So resounding victory. Resounding victory. Congratulations, man. We have to do a whole episode maybe about like why that's so bad for Republicans in the future and how stupid that is for them. Because <laughs> I mean, if cutting I'm, out I'm, participation and making it an, an even smaller well, and, club that's harder to attend and, and branding, right? Like right. primaries are branding opportunities in a, in a sense, right? Like, right. especially when, and man, like that's, that's really, well, it, it's bad for it everybody. Anyway, but yeah, like across the board, just from the, like, you know, not to be cynical about it, but if I'm somebody who works in politics and makes money in politics or a media company that is big enough to get advertisements, uh, like cutting down from the primary to the caucus totally changes the way that you're going to treat the state as a candidate as well. I mean, it, oh, yeah. you know, unless you're, I, you know, unless you're the first one, like who cares? So 
very, very, very Good interesting. Good job, guys. Yeah. We're going to talk later about how stupid the Missouri Republican Party is, but like that is a, in fact, that is a crown, that is a crowning achievement and snatching defeat from the jaws of victory if you want to play the long game. And that is yeah. not what I would tell anybody to do ever. Um, decreased participation and awareness and signals to everybody that your vote doesn't matter right. at all. We yeah. don't want your vote, in fact. And of course, you know, it's Sean, stupid. as you might not be shocked to hear there's reports of uh, basically all of these caucuses that 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 the, uh, there was heavy like heckling and yelling and intimidation toward the Nikki Haley supporters who did show up there were some Haley supporters so right you know, oh wow be almost I guess impressed with those people it's interesting so well uh, speaking of the Missouri Republican Party true or false uh, for those of you outside of Missouri uh, you surely heard about the horrible tragedy at the Super Bowl victory parade for the Chiefs. There was the shooting. Uh, In the aftermath of that, there was a lot of confusion. A lot of bad information was getting out. One of the things that got out was a picture of a man, Denton Loudermill, who had been handcuffed, and a picture had been taken of him sitting in handcuffed. And that picture was sent out, and he is a browner-skinned man. He's not like a super dark skinned person, but you know, obviously some level of ethnic heritage. Right. And so that gets put out and suddenly it gets grabbed by right wing folks saying that this is an illegal immigrant who is the shooter. And it was with like wildfire, as you can imagine something like that going, uh, very quickly it came out that this man had simply been detained because he hadn't cleared the area he was intoxicated at a, at a Super Bowl parade and got handcuffed and sat on the sidewalk in the in the confusion of everything. Uh, the Missouri Senate Freedom Caucus, which is a group of uh, super distilled jerks in the Missouri uh, GOP, put out a, some pretty nasty stuff about this guy, and they have refused to apologize. In fact, they were asked about apologizing, and Senator Rick Bratton of Cass County Uh, Speaking of the sparsely attended caucus, he said, there's nothing that I see even worth that. We've done nothing. And, you know, I have no comment. An absolute refusal to apologize. Great story in the Missouri Independent about all this. So the true false, I'll uh, throw to Sean first, is true false is that the Missouri Freedom Caucus senators owe a major apology. Yeah, they do owe an apology. That's true. I mean, politicizing the deaths of people is always abhorrent and uh you know to take a situation like that that has people so emotionally stunned and upset and try to make it politically beneficial to yourself in the confusion that alone is just awful behavior um and then the fact that they pointed their chode impulses (laughs) towards right. you know a real person um and that they won't apologize this dude bratton uh i don't even <laughs> right it's like that's the right I mean, reaction these to are him, the guys by the way if you were if you were at a bible study in harrisonville these are the guys who would come and egg your house like right. these guys suck these guys are <laughs> the worst of the worst that's all yeah. i'll say yeah, really unfortunate. The guys, uh, this ladder mill fellow, he said, sometimes I'm afraid to go outside of my house or think that somebody who's going to come into my house because some people probably don't even see that I was innocent. It's really, really unfortunate thing. Rachel, what do you think here? It reminded me of Salt Lake City, kind of. Mm. Um, the the So the terror, the bomb that was set off in the, at the uh, uh, opening ceremony during the Olympics. I don't know if opening or closing ceremony. I remember a bomb at the Atlanta Olympics. Atlanta, yeah. Atlanta, excuse me. Yeah, um, yeah and, with the, uh, the security guy. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah, and uh, there was a uh, whole movie about that. That was super misogynistic, so I refused to watch it. Anyway, uh, so it reminded me of that a little bit. Um, I feel like we lawmakers in Missouri have, uh, on the Republican side, have moved on too quickly from this tragedy. Um, it, you know, this wasn't a mass shooter. This was people who were it got into a fight and then shot each other because they had guns on them because everybody Mm -hmm. Missouri can arm themselves, uh, will literally whenever they want, um, without really any, uh, it was like the wild west essentially. Totally. That's exactly what it is now. It is what it is. It is. That is the app term. Uh, 
the the truth uh, just whoever it is that's running against all these people just please give them money wherever you live um if we have a lot of listeners outside of missouri now just just go to these districts i know it seems like a long shot the more money the democrats have in these super 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 gerrymandered districts the harder it is for a complete show like this person to just skate with um i don't know if he's running again or not i don't know if he's going to term out i don't know i don't care what a piece of shit uh and we can't let this be something that everybody moves on from. That's kind of my my overall is that yeah. people should feel happy that this chief's won. And we can't be happy because it's been right. tainted now by literal violence and death. That is, again, it's not the same as a mass shooter. However, it is a problem. Yeah. And Missouri Republicans, I think, are not are using this as a distraction away from the fact that they will not vote for any um sort of sensible gun laws that say things like you can't be in public with a firearm. You just can't, yeah. you just cannot be in, in public with firearm anymore. We're taking that away from you. Well, we, uh, we didn't drop it. So we will make sure that it, uh, remains something that gets noticed as needed. Moving on. Yeah, no. Yeah, no, we've actually got two of them. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna come back to Missouri in a minute, but I'm going to start down in Alabama, uh, where the, not too surprising headline. This is from a Guardian piece group tied to anti-abortion Trump mega donors pours money into Alabama Supreme Court race. Uh, yeah, Sean, I wonder why that could be. Can you imagine why that might be happening? Um, because they represent the extreme fringe of anti-abortion um, yeah. judges. Yeah, right on the heels of the uh, Alabama decision with this extra uterine children IVF implication. Now suddenly we're seeing major, major money flowing in down there. Now, Rachel, I'm sure this is something that has piqued your interest. Yeah. So I read, I, I, I did read the article. Uh, it's been a couple of days since I read it. So it's the, it's the family that started the company Uline. So if you've ever looked for like uh, sort of like office supplies, packing materials, um, and for various reasons in my life, I have purchased things from Uline. And when I saw that, I was like, no, so it's, U L I N E. I guess you can't buy anything from them anymore. Um, it's that family that's put uh, they, they have a pack to support this like far, Rick somebody. It's like this far far. I think his name is Rick. Far 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 right wing judge that's just like, well, IVF should be legal, but also we need to make it not possible to have it. Like it's just these ridiculous statements that show just what happens when the dog catches the car and they don't know what to say. But they've he's comp- he's running against a judge who's basically self-funding her own campaign. She would be the more liberal judge. Right. And she has spent something like 123, I don't know, mid, mid one hundred thousands on her own campaign. And this jackal has about close, close to three quarters of a million dollars from this Uline family who are a staunch, um, anti-abortion so-called pro-life, uh, Pro, I, I'm. So, what is it? What do you even call them now? Like I don't even pro. I think pro life, I, pro, pro life religious at, regulation. Pro, of yeah, I was. I women. would say pro life begins at conception, people, because they're so far afield of anything normal. Yeah. Um, and this kind of goes to something that I know I said, and I think you guys agreed with me, right? When Missouri started doing some really crazy shit right after the trigger law was was put into place. Yeah. Uh, which is that without abortion as the wedge issue, they were going to pivot to immigrants, guns, and making abortion illegaler. And so right. this is a really good example of that. And this week, CVS and Walgreens both announced that they're going to make Mifepristone available. Um, so that's going to, like, this is, like, an interesting, like, time for the medical community might finally sit up a little bit taller and be like, maybe we should donate to this judge. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Maybe, like, Mm-hmm. Where's the where's the pack that's going to support her? Maybe we should start one because like they're not going to be able to uh, function uh, in these places. So it is the ultimate. Yeah, no, um, it's uh, yeah, Alabama, man. Neil Young was right. I just keep thinking that 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 it's that chorus, right? That Alabama, like it's just it's in my head all the time now. Um, so yeah, Neil Young was right. I guess. Sean, any anything else there before we move on? No, no. Yeah, Neil Young was right. It's probably a good place to let that one sit. Uh, bonus, yeah, no, this one, uh, this one comes back to Missouri. So, on uh, this is from the Kansas City Star. 
On Friday, Governor Mike Parson commuted the sentence of former Kansas City Chiefs. It, it says former Kansas City Chiefs assistant coach. It's Andy Reid's son, uh, Britt Reid. Um, and Britt Reid is guilty of a pretty horrible offense. He was very much drunk driving down 435 and put his car into the car of a family. And a very young girl was in a coma and has uh, absolutely uh, lifelong condition as a result of this uh, drunk driving uh, incident. I'm not going to call it an accident because uh, it was very well documented that Britt Reed had some serious problems um, and was still out there allowed to do these things. So uh, it's not an accident. It is uh, a, a crash. It is an incident and it is avoidable. Um, this is the second time that Parson has used his pardon uh power in this way recall the last time somebody along these lines was pardoned was of course the mccloskeys uh after the gun incident where they were convicted as well uh meanwhile uh eric uh devolk and i I, i'm not 100 percent if it's devolkaner or devolkaneer uh but uh a police detective uh who was convicted of uh killing a black man and uh you know, th- this is where he likes to use that power uh, is on cases like that. Um, it's really unfortunate. Uh, Carrie Engel, representative out of Lee Summit, said that she really cannot imagine any justification for commuting a drunk driver who severely injured a five year old. Uh, I will do, I will note that uh, with the commutation, it is not the end of anything for Britt Reed. He is going to be on house arrest and there's some serious requirements uh, along with monitoring and monthly check in. So it is a monitored release at the very least. I'm not necessarily pro keeping people in prison for the sake of saying that they're in prison. So it's kind of one of those, like on the one hand, I don't think people should sit in prison for the sake of sitting in prison. On the other hand, it's hard to ignore, uh, Sean, that this is, you know, extreme power dealing with extreme power at the highest levels for special treatment. Yeah. I mean, Parson, the things that he chooses to do with his power, like you said, it's just always been you know, nakedly galling. political and yeah. Well, special I mean, treatment it's all and, kinds of different things. Yeah. Um, like the one consistency is that it seems like if you're, uh, if you have money and are white, you stand a really good chance to get something good out of Mike Parson. Right. Right. Or another way to think of it is anyone who thinks there's like, you know, need for change from the old good old boys model of politics, right. which is like everybody believes that. Right. Exhibit uh, they're not a. getting it from this guy. Yeah, yeah. Right here is exhibit A. Rachel, any thoughts on this? Yeah. So what was he actually convicted of? He was con- well, he was convicted of the drunk driving with the uh basically it's an assault case that comes out of it because of the okay. uh, the injury. It's you know it's not a manslaughter case because nobody died. Right. Right. Um, but there is the the, the bodily would, harm that comes with it. What would the normal what would the normal sentence that what was he sentenced um, yet? Or I was that... Yeah, so he was sentenced to several years. Um uh, Missouri, okay. if you get a second and I think this I think I'm not hundred percent sure that this which number of DWI this was for him or what all he had on his record. Um but typically when uh there is a second DWI, you can do five years. Uh, pretty easily because it's a felony. So, at that yeah. Point. So here's what I'll say. The reason that <clears throat> uh, law enforcement and the court system takes cases like this seriously and takes, uh, you know, driving under the influence and hurting people. So he, he, got, he got three years, just to be clear. He got three Jesus. years. Okay. So the reason that those sentences exist is to prevent other, to prevent someone from harming someone else. That's what prison yeah. is ultimately for. It's to right. keep people out of, it's, it's the court system acknowledging that certain people represent a danger to society. Right. And so this is also about like, well, we, we said no once you, you ignored it. We said no twice or whatever the hell it is. Right. And so that's, so he, if he does this again, he's learned that there's been no consequence to him for right. ruining the life of an innocent child. I, yeah. I don't know what could be worse than that, except for maybe obviously killing the life killing a child uh, for which he unquestionably would have gone to prison for longer. But yeah. Parson has this way of knowing to go back to kind of what Sean said, Mike Parson is vain. He's just like, he knows that like, this is going to be the thing. He just wants to keep remaining ingratiated with people that he sees as sort of like 
newsmakers right. and like, I, I want to be in the cool boys club and he's got such a lack of political imagination and he's such a doofus and he's such a vain doofus that, um, of course, of course he pardoned. And like, this is the thing, uh, Mr. Reed, uh, I don't, he commuted, I don't have... he commuted his sentence just to, for, you know. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, okay. So, so this means, so he doesn't have to go to prison. That's the part like, right. this dude does not prison. have to go to prison. He gets to leave jail. So this is a consequence free life. And I'm sure it's because uh, our governor gets to talk to or have a conversation with the head coach of the Super Bowl winners and be like, am I your friend now? Are we right. buddies? Like, right. and okay. First of all, no, you're not buddies. He may pretend like he's your friend, Mike Parson, but you're not his friend. He could yeah. give a shit about who you are. Um, He's about to go down as like one of the most successful coaches in the, in the history of the NFL, presumably. And um, you just want to be close to him. Just like when you uh, helped out a, a rich couple in St. Louis that was trending on social media with the, with the alt-right trolls, you wanted to be in with like the Trumpiest of the Trumpers because that was going to get you in the national headline. So our, our governor is a vain uh, dope still. That's uh, I think fairly well said. All right, yeah, yeah. This one, uh, you know, your Starbies order can now be union made. So, congratulations to those of you uh, who, uh, like my wife, who, despite uh, my regular, ad- although actually I will say her Starbucks is way down since we got the fancy coffee machine at the house. So, uh, but the the Starbucks folks, I know that they love their Starbucks. Um, I don't know why. I don't think it's very good at all. But, you know, more power to you. And now congratulations because hopefully you're getting a union-made drink uh, when it happens. I think it's a, a pretty big deal and something just worth, you know, just a yay. Sean? Yeah, so the idea is that the the company, Starbucks, has said that they're now actually going to negotiate with you, the union, the Starbucks workers. Yeah, United. they're going to acknowledge it and actually negotiate. Right. Instead of just trying to kill it. Strong arm it out of every existence. day. Yeah. yeah. No, it's a really big deal. It's a really, really big deal. There's a Starbucks really close to my house. It's right by I-70 and Chambers Road in Denver. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, there's probably... 20,000 people who go through that place every day (laughs) and the people who work there are just regular people, you know, and it's, you know, they deserve respect. They deserve consistent schedules. They deserve paid time off. They deserve benefits, which Starbucks has always tried to be a leader. So it's like, okay, just go ahead and keep being a leader and respect unions, respect your workers. And I don't have to boycott you. Like my small, my very small number of boycotts includes Hobby Lobby, Chris Brown, and now I can go back to Starbucks. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah. In the article from the New York Times, this 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 little paragraph I think kind of sums up the the you know the biggest issue. Starbucks, which has denied the accusations about trying to squash the union, said in a statement that it hoped to have contracts negotiated and ratified by the end of the year, and would agree to a fair process for organizing something the union has demanded for years. It said that as a gesture of good faith, it was providing unionized workers with benefits it introduced in 2022, but withheld from union stores, like an option for customers to tip via credit card, which is wild that Starbucks just started offering that option in the first place. But Isn't Rachel, that nuts? Yeah. Yeah, it's I crazy. think that's so nuts. So the 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 guaranteed schedules. I've talked talked to some of the fight for fifteen folks here in St. Louis many years ago about that. And you know, if you live in there are states, Colorado maybe one of them, Sean. I don't know where. If you show up for a shift, they have to pay you for a half day. They have to pay you for four hours. Um, California was that way. I didn't know that there was another way until I moved back to Missouri, where they're like, oh no, they don't have to pay you at all here. So yeah, you could be there for you, a half an hour. And they could be like, we don't need you to go home. Thanks. Right. And you just so wasted you've lost money because hours, either yeah. you paid for gas or you paid or you spent, you know, however long on, you know, for a lot of these people on the bus and, and younger an hour, yeah, on the bus. You know? yeah. 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 So that is huge. And like the fact that um, Howard Schultz has used his like uh, when he was considering a run for president, he made a big deal about the fact that he was going to pay for the education of Starbucks workers. And I think the asterisk, Sean, you can correct me because I've forgotten was that and I forgot to look it up. I apologize. Um, was that if you were a full-time Starbucks worker, um, and I think you had to work there for a certain amount of time, 
then those benefits kicked in, but it's not easy to become a full-time Starbucks worker. And um, yeah, they paid their employees $50 an hour. But again, what difference does it make if you get there and you're there for an hour and a half and the manager's like, I'm going to send you home because it's slow. Right. And, you know, so I think all of these things also point to the, um, not necessarily the momentum of unionization, because I think that does get overstated a bit, but at least the momentum back towards respecting hourly workers. We've really needed to get back to a place where, because we are, again, transitioning hopefully back to a more uh, North American-based manufacturing economy somewhat. And we need these types of, we need to renormalize um, uh, the ability of workers to negotiate fair wages, better working conditions, especially Mm -hmm. because like, for me, I look at this and I think, okay, what's your move, Amazon? Because right. Starbucks workers right. get treated like shit. And it's, uh, I think that's my fourth shit today. Oh, my fifth, sorry. Um, they get treated horribly. And it got really bad during COVID, right? It just became right. next level during COVID. And Starbucks workers are unfairly treated, but Amazon workers are put in physical danger. They get hurt. Um, and so we, this, this, is, this is kind of where I'm looking at next is to say like, is Andy Jassy, who's the CEO of Starbucks, is he going to finally go, you know what, whatever, go nuts. I don't, you know, organize. We. It's easier to sort of fight them when they come to the table, by the way, and it's better for your company because you can be like, we allowed them to unionize. You can still trust, you can still screw them over. But the other thing I want to say before I shut up about this topic is that um, workers were threatening to, local Anheuser-Busch workers were threatening to strike. Right. And They got that uh, locked up quick. Quick. They were just it, like, it was nope. like it was like so short we didn't even cover it. Like it just right. was like we were going to we yeah. were going to say like they're threatening to strike next day. No, they're not. Um, and it's things like, uh, you know, uh, guaranteed hours and like right. don't close manufacturing facilities. And you know that's really important, especially because Anheuser Busch is now owned by an offshore entity and they don't care about St. Louis. They don't give a right. shit about the lives of people here. Um, so I promise this last time I'm going to use the uh, four letter word <laughs> for the next ten minutes. Um. But, uh, so yeah, so I think you're moving Amazon, but it's, I'm so like, it's, it's really heartening that the, um, pro labor Starbucks people have been working tirelessly yeah. for years yeah. to, to get to this place. So the, I'm sure the negotiations are going to be difficult. I'm sure that like, they're not going to, um, Starbucks isn't going to make it easy for them. Yeah. Um, but it's still like, this is what I want. Okay. I, I know I said I was going to finish. This is what I want to say. The great, the thing that we, the people don't appreciate enough is that when you have wins like this, you hand an entire generation and a lesson in organizing Correct. and a lesson in uh, how you do it. And so one of the problems we've had in America for such a long time is that we lost that institutional knowledge. It just kind of like, it just kind of went away. My generation is useless. Yours didn't, y'all's didn't really have a chance to sort of get it together either because of the way it crashed and all kinds of other things that happened. Right. So we're getting it back. We're getting it back in the bones of like low paid workers. Oh man, that is a huge. Yeah. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. And that's Sean. That's, I was going to throw it back to you on that exact thing. I'm glad Rachel that you said that. Cause that was one of my biggest takeaways was that the Starbucks unionization effort is such a perfect example of if you expect to start doing something like I'm going to do something that's going to cause change, you better understand that that means five to 10 years, not five to 10 months to see the results. Right. No, I think, yeah, Rachel nailed it. And yeah, I mean, it's a huge win for just proving that in a democracy like America's, a liberal democracy where people have freedom, not liberal meaning the opposite of progressive, which is liberal, means the government lets you do what you want instead of kills you like Alexei right. Navalny or like Trump threatens to do. In a liberal democracy, we organize and it works. And it's a really, really big deal. Yeah. Collective action wins every time. Moving on. You don't f-ing say. All right. I love getting to pull this one out. We don't use it all the time. It's reserved for very special things like this one. Uh, This headline is from The Hill's version of coverage on this. You can find coverage in lots of places. Uh, But I love this headline because it it sort of pretends like this is something that 
wasn't capable of being discovered a year ago. Um, so the headline is mansion on no labels quote. They need to take a hard look about whether they will be a spoiler. That was the, uh, the headline. So the, the basic takeaway is that Joe Manchin has figured out that the no labels group might not actually be a benefit to the 2024 election cycle. If you're trying to keep Donald Trump from starting what he has told us is likely to be a dictatorship that will uh, last for some period of time. Uh, Sean, what do you think it was that finally pulled old Joe? Uh, you know, is it just that he's been on the yacht that long? <laughs> it just doesn't get good internet been pondering out there. by himself yeah floating like there he got into face a, in the sun he got into a spat with spectrum <laughs> with the internet provider there's only one provider and just out of principle he's just stayed off the internet yeah someone and, brought him a telegram and said uh senator manchin you might want to take a look at <laughs> <laughs> no i mean it's funny because like joe manchin obviously is a Democrat. I don't know if it's obvious, but he is a Democrat. And so <laughs> every other Democrat who has said anything about no labels has said that. Looks like this thing was cooked up to spoil the election and swing like, it away from Joe like Biden. A and, week. and all of the and all of the never never Trumpers I will mess with, right? All of right. the never Trumpers who right. I, who I will cotton to yeah, um, have said, right. like, dude, don't, right? Like this right. is a terrible idea. Yeah. So it's really funny too. Like he says, no labels needs to do it. You know, they're not, it's, <laughs> you're talking about not a dark a party? money group. Yeah. They're not in the habit of like moral introspection, bro. Right. Uh, I don't, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, this quote right out of Paul the article. Nixon. Right. This quote right out of the article. It says right now, if you can't get, this is mansion right now, if you can't get on 50 States and you're going to basically hit in some of the battleground States that could be very detrimental to what the outcome would be. Yes, Manchin detrimental said, to the outcome. <laughs> when what asked do you if mean, no Joe? Labels you might need to say even spoiler. more. <laughs> yeah, just like come on, man. Like we knew that this is what it was, and then you kept flirting with it. You right. kept flirting with it. Well, the he whole let, time he, he let it be public that he thought he. I don't think he really was. I think he just liked the fact that the even the rumor of the possibility that Mansion was going to run on this like stupid no labels idea, which I didn't ever think he was going to do. By the way ever um uh Heidi Hyde can't maybe because she's not doing anything right now but like him no way uh and like so this is I, this feels like his low key wait this his low key passive aggressive like nonsensy way of saying like oh no I'm not doing this yeah I mean, I, I, at no, some point I, Jay Nixon will look around and be like holy shit am I the only Democrat who's part of this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. well Lieberman is that is, is well is he Lieberman left as an independent Lee yeah, he's not been, a Democrat. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, he's been hosting there... to himself for some time. And I think yeah. Lieberman really wants at one day, like for the people of no labels, whoever these people are, to be like, you know what, Joe? Are you ready? Right. <laughs> yeah. Because well, Joe Lieberman wakes you. up every day remembering 2008 and going, if he'd have just picked me, if he'd have just picked me, if he'd have just picked me, <laughs> just shuffling around, mumbling I'd to himself. I'd love to see it. John Stewart re reprise his Joe Lieberman <laughs> impression from decades ago. <laughs> now That'd that they're good. both how back old, on the how scene. How old is Lieberman? I saw a picture 82. of him and I was like, ooh. So yeah. he's, <laughs> he's older he than actually, Joe Biden. No, he's not. <laughs> yeah, he's older than Joe Biden. Oh, God. But he's also like a different kind of old. I mean, I know Joe he's Biden. Connecticut I know there was like a whole he's Connecticut old. <laughs> He's Connecticut. He's Connecticut old. Oh my God. This is my favorite segment ever. Can we do this every week? Okay. Yeah. He's, uh, yeah, he's 82. Yeah. He's essentially, I mean, if he's not making cookies in a tree at this point, I don't know what, I mean, that's, that would be how I would say he's aged. Um, but, uh, Oh, like, like a Keebler. He looks like a Keebler. Yeah. Okay. I guess. <laughs> this looks like a cartoon character and they can live know? forever do elves live forever or at least really old i never watched any elf i don't know movies, the rules. except for elf, elf right but not course. like the hobbit which is fantastic stuff. yeah no that's what he looks like he looks like bob newhart in elf that's how <laughs> that's how he's aged <laughs> that's how joe lieberman is aged right, let's move on you know it's time to move on when you're talking about Joe Lieberman and Bob Newhart in the same sentence. Uh, buy or sell is the Trump immunity case is the main story of 2024. 
Uh, do you buy that premise or not? Uh, this is from NBC News. Supreme Court agrees to consider Trump immunity claim in further delay of election interference trial. I think that's a very good headline because it actually does summarize everything that is occurring and hits the most important part, which is the immunity claim is set to be heard by the Supreme Court. That is April 22nd, the week of the 22nd. Uh, that is late uh, in the scheduling calendar for the Supreme Court. If you recall, with the Colorado ballot access case, they did did a special hearing for that and issued it, the opinion pretty much instantly. Um, so it's not that they can't do it more quickly. It's that they've chosen to not do it more quickly. They could do it right now. They could do it this week. They could have the, the hearing and they could issue the opinion next week. And bam, we could be off and running with whatever the trials are going to be or not going to be. Uh, there's been plenty of chatter about the immunity issue itself. I think just from a legal perspective uh, that it is important. I'm not shocked by anything that the current Supreme Court rules, right? I will I will not be shocked if they say that that there is some level of limited immunity that carries over for acts while in office uh, that are, you know, somewhat related to the acts of a president versus the acts of a private person or whatever. But I just don't see how they're going to get there because from a legal standpoint, it doesn't really make sense that a person could be elected president of the United States, go out. And, and this is the hypothetical. I, I posted this on my Twitter feed, which is imagine this hypothetical. A person gets elected to the United States presidency. They come into your house. They break into your home. They shoot you while you are sleeping in your bed. Should they or should they not be charged with a crime? That's the question, right? That's what we're really talking about here because, yes, that's not what Donald Trump did, but that is – the immunity claim that he is making, that's what it would allow. That, that's that's right. the that's the 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 extent that you have to take the hypothetical to. So right. uh, well, that's what's so or go ahead. No, I, I was just gonna say I, I buy this. I think that the immunity thing is the um uh, a main feature because I think this is the one issue that is such like the money stuff, the civil suits, the damages, all of that stuff, yes, that is is a way to that's deflating the tires on the Trump mobile. Uh, but the immunity thing to me is the transmission. Like it's like it's the radiator. You know what I mean? Like it's it's an it's a fundamental piece uh, that you can you know you can drive on flat tires and rims for a while, right? <laughs> and, sh- and shred them out and keep on rolling. Uh, but you can't go if the engine doesn't run. And I think the immunity thing is a huge deal, Sean. Yeah. So I mean, I don't know. I don't know about the impact on the twenty twenty four election or like you know when you put it as like the main story, like is it what we're going to be talking about? You know, I don't know about that. I think I'll sell that just for the purposes of this thing. Um, I do want to say that I hope, I just really, really hope that the Supreme court, you know, uh, upholds the law and does not find that the president has presidential immunity over criminal acts while they're in office because these smart judge types, justice types should be smart enough to understand that if Trump can win this case, then, you know, the whole thing of, like you said, shooting someone in their bed or like Trump said, shooting someone on Fifth Avenue right? or a future where every president has a legal imperative to murder all their opponents. Right. That would be bad. Right. Like that would be bad. And that's what a Supreme Court decision does. If they say that the president can't be criminally liable for acts while they're president, that would extend into all the acts that they do. And right, and it would it would open crazy. up the question of immunity for for even more offices, right? Because right. then that we would have that question of where does that where does that immunity extend to? Is that for for senators, uh, for Congress persons? Is so the it vice for president? appointed all the people? Yeah, like the if Mark president? Meadows kills you in your bed because Donald right, Trump decides staff, that you're a threat, is that okay? Right, agents on behalf of yeah, like how does where how far does it go? Embezzlement I mean, cases, bribery, right? Bob Menendez, right? Like if you look at right. him, um, mm-hmm. is he could he be tried? In, is it in legal a to make like a that? deal with a foreign government to yeah, enrich right. himself has at been the charged. expense of the country? Well, it doesn't matter if it's legal because the president has immunity. Right, DOJ oh. has charged Menendez with his crimes as they should, and he should be prosecuted for them. Yeah, that's a great point, Rachel. What do you, what do you think here, Rachel? Buy you buy it or you sell it? What what are your thoughts? I s- I sell that it's the main is I sell that it's the main conversation for 2024. Um, I do want to um, ask you, Adam Summer, attorney, um, person who had dinner sort of 
with um breakfast Scalia. Yes. Breakfast, yeah, with with former justice, the late Justice Scalia. Um why do you think the Supreme Court like how is how in your mind, I know you're not a Supreme Court scholar, you're not a Supreme Court uh a journalist, but why how did because I feel like um Roberts probably wants to get this off his plate. I feel like Roberts probably wanted to get this decision out the door as quickly as possible. Yeah. Why the delay? Is that who is that? Is that Thomas? Is that Thomas and um uh the other moron who I want to hit with a bus someday? Alito. Uh yeah, thank you, Alito. Yeah. Um so my read on and yeah, I'm not a Supreme Court journalist, but I, I do happen to have uh it's one of those things that you just I sort of stumbled in to really watching the Supreme Court and getting deep into it uh, in undergrad because of a certain professor that I had. Yeah, who, sure. Who yeah. is an expert. And totally. so uh, that's, why, I just, that's why I ask yeah. Adam Summer these questions, because I know these things. I've seen his house. I, I do kind of. Yeah, I do kind of live in that rabbit hole a little bit. Um, I think this is a deal. I think that I think that it's probably already decided that they're right. going to rule that he does not have immunity. Right. And so sure. I think that the compromise that they have made internally is the delay. And so by delaying it, they are buying time um, to make it so that it's possible that these trials don't happen before the election, um, which I don't know, you know, from a, from an orderly society standpoint is stupid. Um, I still, I think that the judge probably still orders the trial to happen um, as soon, like basically as soon as they issue this ruling, I think the judge goes, all right, clear this part of the calendar. We're having the trial and it's going to happen in, you know, early September or something like that um, to make sure that it's done. But crazier things have certainly happened. And but that's my read on it is that it's simply a compromise um, because of the, the inner workings of the Supreme court. There is some uh, ability to control what's going on through voting by the justices on what they're going to hear when they're going to hear it. So there's right. going to be some compromise going on there. And I think that's a big part of it. Um, the fact that they took the case up should be, I I think that to me tells me that they're going to uh, rule just, that he same. doesn't have immunity because they could right. have just said, we don't need to look at this. Um, so right. I think they're going to say that absolutely there's, there's no immunity for, for illegal activity. Um, and that, you know, they'll probably carve out exceptions for, you know, operate, you know, the, the difference between operations of the commander in chief in furtherance of the duties of the office versus uh, activity of a candidate or a private individual. Which um, it totally, absolutely, completely, thoroughly was, right? Like, there's right. no question that he wasn't doing his president. He wasn't doing his job as president. Well, like, and then the White House stumbled didn't pay crime. for that rally. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, That's right. That, That's that right. was a campaign event. And so, the, like, that everything that behalf, happened on January yeah. 6th was a campaign fund event. And that's really the distinction that it comes down to is how are you operating? Are you operating and, as a candidate or as the president? And if you're and ab- operating to hold on to your job, right. you're Correct. never Illegally. actually doing your job. Right. Right. And, and that, to, right. Even if you are acting as the president, if you then do something, because is it legal to kill people as the president to order deaths? It is if you are doing so with enemy combatants with the military, right? But if you're talking about acting against private citizens that are United States citizens, those are those are two different rules on what the president would be allowed well, you, to even order at that point. And doesn't have the president doesn't have the power. And to, if you look at what he's, just what he's being charged death. with as as a citizen, citizen right. Trump is being charged with disrupting a basically like a, f- a federal process, right? right? Like he's, or he's being charged with disrupting. And he would have um, no right. Even, even if you look at it as a presidential issue, he would right. have no power as the president to That's have right. interrupted that process That's due right. to separation of powers in the first place. I'm going to, and I'm going to, I'll stop here. I'm going to sound like Adam summer for a second. So the, I've, you know, one of the, uh, I've say this all the time that one of the real joys and, and uh, delights and like how we're going to talk about this in the last call, but how, working with two people who have one practicing lawyer, one who has a law degree has kind of like impacted me as sort of a a thinker is that it makes me understand the court system a little bit better. Um, uh, I've, I've had other friends that are lawyers, but they're really highly specialized lawyers. They like, you know, bankruptcy and that kind of thing. Uh, and Adam, you are a generalist practicing attorney. You're, you're just, you just, you just do courts. You do all kinds of courts. Mm-hmm. You represent all sorts of, uh, court, like legal issues. And the, Padre of people that surrounded Donald Trump that led to the January 6th insurrection mostly have been found guilty of very serious crimes yeah. and are in jail serving their sentences right now. The yeah. founder of the Oath Keepers, the founder, one of the 
proud boy idiots. Oh my God. I forgot his name. Isn't that great? Um, and like most of the people that were tried were found guilty of something. And so it's not, you know, for people that say, so that's just an example of like, I know the court system is going to, this is where I sound like Adam Summer. I know the court system looks like it moves slowly, but it kind of moves deliberately right. and you sort of want it to move on the slower side of things because then justice will actually in some way be served. If it's rushed, I'm not saying that they should have delayed this thing's ridiculous. Thing's stupid. Um, they should have just done it right away. I agree. Um, so, it, you know, it, it, it's, it's more important that the right outcome happens than it is that the outcome that you want happens right. because the outcome that you want ha that to happen because it's Donald Trump could impact another president very negatively later. Imagine if um, this were kind of shotgun through and it was sloppy and every appeal wasn't exhausted and all these other kinds of things. The next time there is, I mean, look at how divided uh, the Senate is right now. Um, they're trying to impeach Joe Biden for nothing. Like, so the idea that this is still sort of a, a complicated process doesn't inherently bother me because it should be. Yeah. Um, and the last thing I was, so that's just kind of something for people to think about. The last thing I want to say is this doesn't really help Trump. I know that sounds crazy, but hear me out. So Trump loves to be in courtrooms. Right. It helps him because it helps him raise money. That's it. It's very right. simple. And he needs, we're going to talk about this in a minute, literally in a minute. Um, oh my God, does that dude need some serious cash B mm -hmm. badly? He really mm -hmm. needs money. So being a defendant, whether it's, it's going to hurt him in the long run, I think this is going to be terrible for his physical health. Um, the stress of, of, of several, one trial alone is terrible. Ask Hunter Biden. Um, but many is unthinkable. I can't imagine. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, it, not being in court saying you're per, they're persecuting me again, Everybody, did you see what they said on Fox News about me, about how I didn't do anything wrong, blah, blah, blah. Um, that would help him. Uh, the closer these arguments get to the election, the more it might not help him, I think. Right, so right, right. that's what I have to say. So walk away from the headlines and say, oh, Trump, this has helped. The, the Supreme Court just handed Trump a win. I don't, I think that's a massive personally i think that's a massive overstatement I agree. That, the, that the supreme court just like gave donald trump the 2024 election i think that they uh, whoever it is that's arguing on his behalf in the court obviously is saying like well a president he needs more you know we have to give him more time that's the thought process that he needs more time to kind of like deal with the other uh charges and the other you know situations in these other venues especially georgia um, but did they hand him a victory? Sh stop. No, not even. Are you kidding? He has this looming in the background now. Right. So now he's still going to pay lawyers. He's still yeah, going to pay and, lawyers a massive amount of money to argue in front of the Supreme court. That is right. hundreds of thousands of dollars that he needs now. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. Plus they, they pretty much know what the outcome is likely to be Sean. Uh, and and I, I do love that point, Rachel, about the time aspect of it all, because I, I look at the way the justice system works similar to like, I can build you a house fast or I can build you a house well, but I can't, you know, it, there, there's three rules in business, right? I can give it to you fast. I can give it to you cheap and I can give it to you done right, but I can only give you two of the three. So you have to pay. That's right. That is um, cardinal. Yeah. Right. It's a basic rule of all of it. And that's kind of what the justice system is, is that it, it's a, it's also just one of those places left in life. And I, I have to talk about this often with folks is that like there isn't a two day shipping option. Right. There isn't a, I pay more. I get it faster. Instacart delivery to my door. Yay. I get to have what I want when I want it because I live in a world of instant messaging and instant gratification. And now I'm a hamster instead of a person. Sorry, that doesn't exist in the justice system. Uh, that's disappointing. I understand that. But this is the way it works. It's the way it's always worked. This isn't new. Uh, yes, this particular Supreme Court, I'm not a fan, and I'm not going to be a fan for probably a long time, as long as Justice Thomas and Alito are on there. And if they get replaced by similar type figures, it's going to be a, a, a tough several decades, folks. Strap in. Welcome to Consequences of 2016. Uh, we're here. We're living in it right now. This is what many of us told you was going to happen. Uh, Sean, final word on this before we move on to the final uh, segment. I think I'm just ready to talk about Joe Biden. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, let's do it. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> it's our election coverage era. 
Uh, it's been a few weeks since we oh, dropped great. that for the first time. I forgot how fun it was. Uh, it's just so hard. Uh, 2024 election era. We're here. We're in it. We're in the thick of it. We're in the throes of it. Uh, I've got lots of different things that I've dropped into the notes. Um, I'll just I'll rattle these off and then I'll turn it over to Sean to set the table better. Uh, is Biden's Michigan problem a media creation or a serious issue? Uh, we had the dueling border wars visits down in Texas. We've got Trump's increasing money pit that Rachel alluded to. Uh, we now have an alleged VP list for Trump, and it is uh, hilarious and juicy. Uh, we have the uh, the Biden replacement debate. It continues. Um and, uh, you know, all kinds of good stuff out there. And then Axelrod dropped uh, an opinion piece uh, that I did in- include here, even though uh, Axelrod, of course, said really stupid things about Taylor Swift and uh, the Chiefs. And he owes uh, – I will continue to to hold his feet on that one. Um, I'm going to start with that piece to, to turn it over to Sean and then and set the table on the rest. So uh, Axrod wrote in a CNN piece, here's the dirty little secret that Tuesday's Michigan primaries laid bare. President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump are bitter rivals who desperately need each other. Biden and Trump each won their primaries handily in the Wolverine state and wrote to their expected rematch. Yet the story of the night was the votes they didn't get, suggesting the degree to which each will be relying on fear of the other to bring recalcitrant voters around in the fall. Uh, it's good to see Axe back saying smart things again instead of dumb things. Uh, Sean, what do you think? Uh, is is you know what's what's standing out to you right now as you're thinking about 2024? Totally, yeah. So the the Axelrod article, like you said, I think was really smart, and you know I don't think he belabors. You know I don't think he says everything he could say. Um, when he puts stuff out, because he his knowledge of how to win a presidential election is quite deep, and in terms of living humans, um, somewhat unparalleled. Right. Um, but yeah, this idea that the biggest danger is the votes that they that they can't hold on to, and the need to drive turnout based on kind of fear of their opponent winning is a very I think, you know, that's true. That's what's going on. And it's also dangerous when that's going on. If you're the candidate who's trying to get people afraid of your opponent, that's not optimal. It definitely moves people. And that's why it's part of the mix. um, But it's not great. And, you know, I think I was I was talking with my wife, Michelle, about this just yesterday and, uh, you know, kind of like summing up what's happening in the news. And I think this week, if there was one piece of news that came out, you know, it's news that we kind of already knew, but it's like, it's almost certainly going to be Trump and Biden in this election. Right. And, you know, we're saying we kind of already knew that. And when I say to Michelle, she's incredulous. She cannot believe it. Um, And that's why it continues to be news (laughs) because (laughs) people cannot actually comprehend that that's reality. And I'm also... I'm also in that in that camp, you know, like this article that says uh right, just because it's true, does that make it a good thing? I guess is a <laughs> a reasonable question. It's not good. No, it's not good. Um yeah, it's not good for America for you know two 80-year-old men to be battling it out when their main message is you do not want the other guy. Like it's not good. Yeah, what were you, you were getting at an article uh there? Oh, yeah. So the the two that I was looking at most deeply were the ones where uh I guess Walter Shapiro, who that name sounds familiar, but I actually don't know who that is. He kind of takes the media to task for overhyping the protest vote in Michigan where over 100,000 Michigan Democrats marked their ballots uncommitted in Tuesday's presidential primary, spurred on by an organized sent him a message protest movement against Joe Biden's public support for Israeli actions in Gaza. And then he minimizes this by, this is funny, I think this is kind of an old guy and definitely not a Midwest guy who's writing this because he goes, he goes, these angry Democrats concentrated in Detroit suburbs with large Muslim populations and college towns could all fit into the University of Michigan's football stadium with a few nosebleed seats left over. How impressive 
is a protest vote in the nation's 10th largest state equal to a game day football crowd? If it's a Michigan football crowd, pretty fucking impressive. Yeah, if, if anybody who knows anything like, about that, my tell mind's you that eye that's, yeah. has an impressive scene, a yeah. massive building, you, the biggest one in the think, state. Do you what know what, do you what they think? call Hacked. that stadium? Do you guys know what they call that stadium? No. The Big House. Its nickname is The Big House <laughs> because it's one of the biggest stadiums in North America because it holds 110,000 people. Yeah, so that what is, is impressive. You, what Go did ahead, you sorry. think of the part of the article? Because you're talking about the New Republic article that that I thought was really actually I liked it. Um, not because I necessarily wanted to agree with it, and I'll talk about what in a second. But I wanted to know what did you think about the the mar- when he talks about the margins that Haley got and how incredibly off the media was about what Trump's victory was going to look like in Michigan. I thought that was the most interesting part of that article. Is that the is that unless that was a different New Republic article that I read last week? But I think it's this one where. The, the the pundits were like, oh my God, Trump's going to win by 60 points or something. And he did not like he was, he, he won by a far smaller margin than that. So I think that is kind of interesting. And I would love to hear what you have to say. So about he's that kind of bit. showing, oh yeah. Well he says, yeah. And he even says that Nikki Haley received roughly three times as many votes as the Democrats uncommitted protest undermining the journals, the Wall Street Journal's attempt at false equivalence, Haley demonstrated for the third primary in a row that Trump faces serious problems with affluent, college-educated Republicans. So here's what I'll say. So when there is a contest between two people and one of them is organizing people to vote for that candidate, yes, it's kind of a protest vote, but you know, primary voters who lose or their candidate loses almost always come home. You know, that's the whole point. Right. Um that I think he misses because when younger, you know, city and suburbs based voters who actually do represent, you know, kind of a, a break with the president on policy, they right. show up and vote uncommitted and they don't vote for Dean Phillips or Marianne Williamson. I think it does really suggest that they are in danger of staying home. But and, but isn't isn't that the same logic though? Isn't saying that the Haley supporters probably come home to Trump? Doesn't that logic apply to the uncommitted protest voters right now regarding Joe Biden? And if not, then you know is it be, because of the nature of this? This is such a right. This well, is think never, about it in terms of civics. I got gotcha. you. You're right. Right. You have a point to make there. But to, think about it in terms of civics and actual real world getting out to vote. Right. Do you think that the people who showed up to vote for Nikki Haley, knowing what we might know about them, are likely to sit out the 2024 election? They're actually probably more likely to vote for Joe Biden. So that that's exactly <laughs> what I was going to say. That's is that, what I yeah, think, too. That, but to the me, uncommitted are in big danger, I think, of, you know, I have some, I have some well, thoughts about that. Or, finish, or yeah. voting for a third party candidate. Yeah. No. And that, no. that's why I want to say this and then toss it back to Rachel because I, 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 I would suggest that I, I think the New Republic article makes a good point. I think, I think it's a little too like incredulous. It's a little, it's a little patronizing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's, but the, the point of, because this is unprecedented, right? We have never, ever, 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 ever had this type of primary where we have a sitting president who is being questioned on their return while we have a former president who was voted out of office running in a contested primary with a it's really, pretty high just, level, you know, member of their own party. Let's, and so I think let's just pause there for just a second. Everybody take a deep. That is insane. Right. Right. That just is crazy that, right? pants town. That is bananas. That shouldn't be possible. Like um, assuming all of this survives for a very long like, time, this can you will imagine be one of the most written about periods in American electoral ever, like, history. Can you can you imagine period. if in 1984, instead of Mondale running, Jimmy Carter had been like, what about me? Right. right. Like or like or if George H.W. Bush in 1996, right? If he'd been like, right. I know, I'm the guy. There's a reason. While Bob Dole was is still hanging on right. in the primary. There is a reason that that never happens. It's because normally it's a terrible idea. Right. Because the party's like, no, 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 no. We have, I mean, you know, maybe in 1984 it would have been a better, I don't know, whatever. Like, but there is a reason it never happens, right? So I just want to like... I, the, and I feel like the the press and the reason I like the New Republic article, and then I'll give it back to you, Adam, is that it questions the fever pitch and the breathlessness of the coverage about the protest vote in mm-hmm. Michigan 
without really acknowledging the bigger picture, which is that Trump should not be running for the presidency again, period. That should not be happening. Um, his yeah, party I mean, should he, accept he, him. He tries to ding other headlines for being breathless when they're not even that breathless. All they said was it was more uncommitted than we thought. And so that's kind of the premise of his article is that other articles overhyped right. the turnout. Which I do agree like, with, which I do agree with, by the way. But anyway, go ahead. But it's like it's just happened. Like each state only gets one primary. And like this is what happened in the Michigan one. And like Obama or uh, Biden, you know, missed out on getting 100,000 right. votes in his own primary. So I guess I guess what I was getting at is that in Sean, you, you hit on it, which is that when I see the Nikki Haley stuff, um, and when you see the type of, you know, sort of the way the cross tabs are working, where, like you said, Sean, like it's the it's the suburban educated Republican voters, right? These are the people who are voting for Nikki Haley. Um, these are also exactly the type of voters that we're talking about, uh, you know, seeing react to abortion, uh, you know, to reproductive rights issues um, and and sort of, you know, these are the people who don't want Donald Trump to come yeah. back and to office. Is... Go ahead, like, sorry. isn't that, isn't that a stronger push, I guess, than like if, if I, if I'm on the left, right. And this has been my sort of my working theory of this entire election. If I'm on the left and I'm unhappy that, cause I'm not, I'm not like walking around like, yay, because we get to have an 80 year old guy as our standard bearer. And this is so, like, no, I'm not like hundred percent yeah, about Joe Biden as the candidate. But the idea in 2016, I wasn't pumped about Hillary Clinton, but I also didn't like I thought that Donald Trump probably shouldn't be the president. But I didn't know that he definitely shouldn't be the president. Whereas now in 2024, we now have all of this evidence and this reason to know who this guy is. And now it's not like this wink and a nod where it's like, okay, Trump is lying because he's he knows that he can lie to this base and get away with it. We know that's what's happening. But now he's also saying it and he's saying things, he's using words like dictator. He's he's, you know, talking about really horrendous policies while we have this abortion thing hanging over the top. And Nikki Haley's not getting five percent of the vote in these places. She's right. getting thirty percent of the vote. Right. She's getting forty percent right. of the vote in these places. And so yes, it's it's should be trouble to the Biden campaign that they're having protest votes occur. But I just think it's wildly different from a primary where we have huge swaths of voters. Like Nikki Haley's getting delegates. Nobody else right. is getting delegates in the right. Democrat. So side. what matters just, if I, if if I could just say something the- if I could just say something really quick about, about this, because I, I, I think just it's let Sean run. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is this is so this is this is why I want to say this right now because I think this is something that Sean um should comment on. So The Michigan primary, the way that it's structured is that undecided um, or uncommitted is already on the ballot. It's not a write-in. It's something they can actually already do. So because there is a high concentration of Arab Americans, the national Arab community focused a ton. And also Rashida Tlaib is is, is in one of these these districts. They were able to leverage the one theater they had in American politics to show Joe Biden just how serious they are about ending the unnecessarily, the unnecessarily just horrendous and uh, t- like right, disgustingly cruel, violent, violent death toll in 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 Palestine and in Gaza, and like to kind of like do everything he can to pressure Netanyahu to come back and talk about a two state solution, something that Netanyahu doesn't even want. So this wasn't just Michigan. This was right. the this was uh so I listened to an interview on Democracy Now with Andy Levin who is a former congressman from Michigan he's a Zionist um I think he's a rabbi uh and James Zogby who's the president of the Arab American Institute and they were talking about the effort and the money and the time and the everything that went into this vote and James Zogby who uh is you know a person who who's activism goes back to like the late eighties. He worked with Jesse Jackson to get uh voting for a two state solution as part of the, um, uh, 1988, uh, democratic primary to turn that into a platform of the, of the democratic party. Like that's, he's the person who was like, we need to argue for a two state solution in America. He said, this doesn't need to happen anywhere else. We made our point. We wanted to make this point. It's far more successful than we could have ever imagined. Um, and this was them like basically throwing the flag up to the Biden campaign to say, 
this has to go beyond platitudes. You have to bring Netanyahu is to Israel what Donald Trump is to America. Period. Full stop. The end. And the um, APAC money, which is influencing St. Louis politics now, is largely Republican, and they're doing what they can to make sure that basically like war hawks remain in the House of Representatives because that's, that's what they want. So what is, this was Andy Levin's comment, what is Republican money doing in the Democratic Party? It shouldn't even be there. Now, he, I think he was defeated by a pro-APAC um, candidate in a, in a primary. So I thought that was really interesting because that's, I think, what the new republic article is kind of getting at is to say like you have to kind of look at the bigger picture and i think as far as grassroots organizing this was top 10 want to talk about like it's up there with like starbucks getting a union this is like if you're going to argue for peace this is how you do it you look for the opportunity that you have as an organ as organizers and go where can we do it how can we do it where's our money best bet brilliant but this is what it was it was an effort to organize so this wasn't like a bunch of people that are just like oh i don't know what i'm gonna do i just i don't like anybody this was the result of people who were really serious about it um and i think that shows in like the marianne williamson oh my god can i just say like the fact that marianne williamson who dropped out of the race beating dean phillips dean phillips made my week that's (laughs) all i needed so I just wanted to throw that over to Sean to say, first of all, like the way that the ballot is structured in Michigan is unique and different, um, not going to be repeated anywhere else. Um, and um, the impact of the organ of, the, of that organizing, which I think Sean and I are the kind of people that just like, we love that stuff. We love seeing like, yeah, do it. Make your voice heard. This is the time to do it. But what I heard coming from other experts um, this week that I read lightly here and there said, this doesn't mean that all these people are going to not vote for Joe Biden. That's the mistake, right? That's just to to think that these hundred thousand people are all going to stay home um, and to overestimate the, um, the zeal they would have for either voting for someone else or allowing Donald Trump to take Michigan. Sean, take us, take us home. And then we, and then we have a last call for the subscribers reminder. You can get signed up at heartlandcollective.com. Five bucks a month gets you into the last call. Uh, we'll go into the last call after this episode with a preview for everybody that will cut off pretty quickly. And if you want that episode, subscribe to our Patreon and you can have it yourself in your podcast feed. Sean, take us home on this topic. Sure. Yeah. So the, the protest voted in Michigan, you know, I think should be ringing alarm bells for Biden. <laughs> um, and really, I think what I wanted to say is like, you know, these, these, these events don't happen in a vacuum. Um, and you know, what, you know, what matters is not really what we think about it or even what's true about it in the moment, but that's a good point. You know, like how do the campaigns respond? You know, so we know that part of how Trump beat Hillary in Michigan in 2016 was by relentless spending on dishonest, highly targeted digital ads. Right. And so if I'm on a campaign, if I'm on Biden's campaign, I'm not thinking like, oh, you know, these journalists are misunderstanding Michigan. I'm thinking like, oh, shit, what's going to happen <laughs> when endless sums of money go into Detroit and voters who are likely to sit at home and not vote for President Biden, maybe because they think he's responsible for a lot of death and things that they don't agree with, you know, and what I would be thinking if I was on Joe Biden's campaign is we got to get our ads in front of these Haley people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> And like, that's, I think the takeaway, you right. know, a Haley voter could absolutely be a Biden voter. And the way right. that I've been seeing the polls recently, Biden won against Trump partly by bringing white women back who abandoned Hillary, right. um, suburban women, and also by having better turnout among minorities in the Rust Belt. And right. so if minorities in the Rust Belt have a problem with bombing the shit out of Gaza, like, that's a problem. Right. And he might look to fill that hole with Nikki Haley voters. It's a good point, Sean. And, and, and let me let me add this to it and give it back to you. So if you look at the Michigan results, uh, Nikki Haley, uncommitted, Ron DeSantis, Chris Christie, Vivek Ramaswamy, Ryan Brinkley, I guess, is on there. I don't even know who that is. And Asa Hutchinson. If you add all of those votes up, it's roughly 2050, about 350,000 
votes. So we're talking about 100,000 uncommitted protest votes, and there's 350,000 people who made a point of voting in the Republican primary in Michigan that voted for not Donald Trump, um, which is when you compare that, Donald Trump had seven, about 760,000 votes in that primary. So out of basically 1.1-ish million votes, um, 30% right, said no thanks to Donald Trump in a primary where it's not a contest. Um, right. That's that's a lot of votes when you when you know, when you look at that, if half of those votes were to stay home and half of, and another half of those votes were to go to Joe Biden or if even a third of those votes go to Joe Biden, it takes care of the protest vote issue in Michigan. Right. It covers that up completely. Right. Just, yeah, that's like, just an interesting. As you try problem, to make the Michigan thing smaller for Biden. You just you end up zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in on Detroit. And right. then as you try to like minimize the significance, you're like, well, Joe Biden could do worse in Detroit and still be president again. It's like, could he? That's a good point. It's a very Big good point. <laughs> I just yeah. I just think I just think this is what I'll say about this whole thing. So when you look at Donald Trump's record in Israel, right? He moved the US embassy to Jerusalem, which is an absolute complete slap in the face and huge insult to the Arab community in Palestine. Um, uh, basically saying like, you're, 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 you have no inheritance to this region. And that is from my limited understanding um, compared to experts of the issues in Gaza, that is, or the issues I should say in Palestine, that is one of the warts on the final negotiations of the Oslo Accords. They could not agree on these holy right. sites. And like, that's to me is where I tear my hair out and go, thank God I still live in a sort of secular with an asterisk country. Because when you deal with states that are driven by religion, this is what ends up killing sort of the process of negotiation. So Donald Trump basically pushed the kind of, I'll say like pro-right agenda in Israel so far over the line that now what Palestinians would settle for is kind of almost permanently off the table. Right. So it, it's hard to it's hard to overstate how anti-Arab Donald Trump was as a president. Well, that, and, that, that I think is why, to to Sean's point about the minimization, it's part of why I I, I don't mind minimizing it simply because are are do we really think that the people who are upset about what's happening in that region right now? do we really think that they are going to vote for Donald Trump as a better solution? Like, do we really think that they're going to switch over to somebody who obviously can't be pressured to do anything ever at all, who would, who would get, turn the keys over to Netanyahu and say carpet bomb. Who would also, and also who would like destroy labor unions. Like that's the other things is that Biden has a very strong relationship now with the auto workers union. And it's, Michigan. So that's like the other part of the, uh, the, I know that's the other, to me, that's the other kind of, I'm going to make up a saying that's the other leg on the horse. Like I just can't ignore that part of it. Um, the media is happy to, um, in this conversation, because I think that's what the, the, the new Republic article kind of gets back at is that we're living in this time of whiplash where the media just kind of seizes this narrative and doesn't sort of look at sort of like the greater picture. And I think that Biden, while he's old and like, when I see him, like, screwing up the difference between like screwing up saying Ukraine instead of Israel in a normal kind of garden variety press conference where you're sitting in front of a fireplace. And I slap my own forehead. Um, Cause that is not great, but he also has a record that shows that like, he's the first president, even um, in this interview I'm talking about in democracy, Today, Andy Levin's like, he likes his record. You know, he likes Joe Biden. He's like, I like Joe Biden. He's got a great record on him. names, like all these other things that you can't overlook. And I think that's the other side of it. It's not just like this Democrat as business as usual guy that the kind of conservative parts of the Democratic Party and the moderates of the Republican Party wanted. He kind of shifted the the Overton window back to labor, back to like, let's get let's make electric cars normal. Um, let's, uh, let's have a diverse cabinet of people. Like he may be old, but his cabinet isn't his cabinet's one of the youngest in history. His median, the median age of all of his cabinet members is something like, I don't know, 37 or something. It's like super young. So all of those things are factors. And I think what Sean said is right though. Like those things exist, but if you don't tell people about it, they won't know. And I don't, that's where I get concerned is like, where is the messaging and what are you going to do? So he's talking about a ceasefire now. I don't think that would be happening if it weren't for this vote. So I want to end with saying 
I think that this is one of the most extraordinary examples of grassroots organizing that I have ever seen in this stage of a presidential contest. It shows me that the left is has learned how to leverage power in a way like they never have before. This is not a vote of anti-Semitism. And if you say that, I will pop you in the nose figuratively because it is that is not what's happening. These are people that are protesting the non, the utterly unnecessary and merciless slaughter of innocent people who don't deserve um, this level of violence. And they're using whatever, whatever political means they have to demonstrate that at a time when this president knows his own vulnerability. So I just want to say like, I think this is an interesting moment. I don't, I don't look at it as a tragedy and I just want to, I didn't want to make it sound like we were just sort of talking about a horse race a little bit. No, that's fair. Sean, final word. And then we're going to move on. Okay. Yeah. I just want to, I don't want us to miss that Trump said his VP shortlist and yeah, yeah. let's all pick oh, one. Go. Yeah. Go. Amen. Greg yeah. Abbott, Byron Donalds, Christy Noam, Tim Scott, and Ron DeSantis. I think of those five, if it's one of them, Trump lies all the time. So it could just obviously be someone different. Um, Byron Donalds of Florida, the representative congressman is my, that's who that is. What, what is he, what is his deal? I've never even, he just loves Trump and uh, he's somewhat charismatic, somewhat Mm -hmm. smart, but he's a Republican in Florida and he's black and he loves Trump. Can he raise money? Like that's what I would be looking at if I were Trump. I don't know. Yeah. I think it's gnome. That's of that list. I think she's the one that, tops the list for me because she's just she's everything that trump is this, isn't is this, this is a question for sean so is this so similarly it's not gonna be list. tim scott by the way yeah yeah whatever uh is he can this, debase so, himself all he wants uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and he will and he will he will he will <laughs> so similarly to when the short list of the biden VP the running mates came out um, the rumor has always been the scuttlebutt was always that the reason Harris got the pick aside from some of the obvious reasons that she was seen as a more progressive member of the Senate, that she's young, that she's a woman of color, blah, blah. There's never, none of those things that ever been, had ever happened before. Um, it was simply that she was like really good at raising, well, she really like turned money out to turn around her donors for the Biden campaign during the, uh, primary. So is this, cause the, some of the people that are running, and again, I'm talking directly to Sean. You don't have to listen to Adam. I don't care. I'm just kidding. Okay. So <laughs> the, 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 what I've read about the Trump campaign, I forget the name of his campaign advisor. I think he's about to basically take over the Republican party. Um, is that he is kind of a button down straight shooter. He's very not Trumpy at all. He's kind of seen as sort of an adult. So is this them saying to these people, let us see how much money you bring to the campaign and then we'll decide. Is that, is that even like, or is it just Trump being ridiculous? Right. Yeah. I don't even know if it would be as I'll even call that fair. That would be a fair way to decide. Um, <laughs> Trump doesn't sense. do that. He just that wants these people sense. to start debasing themselves in front of cameras. Or, ass, yeah, yeah, I think that's well, what yeah, it in, is. That, in that case, I can I can think of no one who will debase themselves more than Christy Noem because she just has no shame at all. And he likes he's, that she's got the right haircut. She's got that Fox News pundit feathering going on still the long the long flares that he likes so much. She looks good in a skirt. Are you picking her? Yeah, for your if you were going to pick one I, of those five. I thought I, she was uh, Christy Dome has been on my short list for a very long time because Absolutely. of all of the reasons that I just said. She's attractive. Um, she doesn't have a lot of like negatives in the national spotlight because she hasn't really been a part of the national spotlight. Um, and she will she will lick him up one side and down the other for days. And that's kind of, I think that well, that's what that old man wants. And I think what his campaign wants is probably somebody who can look good in a photo and make she, a speech. She's but, a, she's a literate, a literate Sarah Palin. I, I think that's <laughs> being kind. I don't know that I was, I, I'm not going to, I just mean Christy from Noma. the package, like the, like, what do you bring to the table? It's it, like, she checks a lot of the same boxes that Palin checked. Yeah. And that should be a reason not to nominate her, by the way. Like that should be, I'd like to be, which is why I think ah, he'll probably but remember that the, when, yeah. when they nominated Sarah Palin, the polls went bananas. McCain went up by like five points. Like he was leading the race Still, and then she talked. Yeah. I would bet so, that Sarah Palin's team placed a call to Donald Trump's team after 100%. this. hundred percent. Oh, for sure. A hundred percent. But I think like, I hope uh, there's a part of me that really kind of hopes it's Christy Noem because she is, man, you want to talk about a dumber than a box of hammers. I mean, she cannot string two sentences together. I remember some of her speeches during COVID and I was like, 
I mean, you're, I was like, woman, you are lucky that you live in a low populous state. Um, because I can't believe that you just said that out loud. Like she's, it's, it's kind of goes back to like the question that we've Sean and I, we've talked about before. And Sean always kind of clarifies, like, are you dumb or are you venal? And I think in her case, it's, she's dumb. She's just dumb. She's like Mike Parson. She's just vain and stupid. Um, so if, if Trump knows what's good for him, he won't nominate her, which makes me think that that's what he'll do. That's, that's what she's always taught. What, what do you list. think, Sean? Do you have a pick? Oh, no, I think it's going to be representative Byron Donalds. Yeah. You really think it's going to be Donalds? Interesting. I do. All right. Very so let's informal wager. Or someone I'll, not on the list. That's my, that's my app. Okay. I'm going to say the same. So it's none of the above or Christy Nome. And what do you want to wager? This is like a really low key wager. Cause I don't really, it's, it's all going to be terrible. So, uh, what do you want? You want a t-shirt? I will buy you a t-shirt for any campaign of your choosing. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually what I would love it if you would buy for me is a union made red, make abortion legal again <gasps> hat. What? what? You might be able to get your hands on one of those. Oh. All right. Well, maybe. Where am I going to get one of those? Hmm. I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to see. Interesting. Okay. A nice Interesting. little teaser at the end of the episode. Uh, we're going to switch over into the last call preview. Uh, so if you're a subscriber, you can go over and get your full episode. And if you're not enjoy the, the teaser. And if you think I got to have more, you can have more, just go to the heartland collective.com and sign up for the Patreon today. We'll be right back. Last call. All right. Welcome into the last call. Uh, this is the subscriber special feature. Uh, so this will fade out here in just a moment. As I have said, if you want more, go to heartlandcollective.com and get signed up for Patreon over there. Uh, nice little preview by Sean of potentially things to come. We'll have more information on that, I'm sure, very shortly about potentially union-made red hats that say make abortion legal again. Uh, that'll be a lot of fun. Uh we're here for the last call, and the, the topic that I have written down is I disagree to agree, but I am not disagreeable. Uh, we all have experienced, uh, certainly in the last several years, plenty of hot disagreements, whether you're talking about COVID issues or Donald Trump or abortion or other hot button issues in the last uh, you know several years. Uh, but really what this is more about is our ability to – continue to have conversations, to work with people, to deal with each other, and to do so in a way that allows us to be honest with one another in, in disagreements uh, while not viewing another person's disagreement as personal uh, without taking things as personal attacks and realizing that there's a difference between um, sharing a, an honest opinion with somebody and attacking that person. And there's then obviously there, you know, you Attacks can be hidden behind. I'm just being honest. Um, that's certainly something that all of us have probably been guilty of at some point in our lives. Uh, but there's a big difference between attacking somebody with, uh, you know, being hyperbolic or, you know, uh, adding context to something that just makes it mean instead of useful. You're right. Constructive criticism versus just being mean to somebody. Those aren't the same thing. Um, and just being able to continue to have those conversations, we dealt with that internally, uh, in a couple of different ways recently. Um, you know, the three of us, uh, have our disagreements from time to time. And sometimes we do it here on the show, right? Uh, you know, uh, Sean is still trying to convince us about the 2024 election in Joe Biden, uh, which is, which is good though, right? It's, it's part of the conversation is that we want to bring more than one perspective. And that's why as a business, we try to bring more than one perspective to each other and, you know, to sort of raise that curtain now that we're in the zone of, uh, the subscriber area, you know, we have those disagreements internally. Um, sometimes we get feedback from folks about what we do or don't do. Um, and so, you know, it's not a secret to those of you who listen to us a lot that all three of us do uh, use naughty language on here from time to time. I think we all three have done it uh, today at some point and we try not to use it a ton because we want this to be, you know, you can listen to this hopefully whenever. Uh, but in the last call, of course, now we're in this, this particular part where we do, you know, whatever, every, everything goes, no holds bar at this point because you've paid to be here. So we assume that's, that's okay. Um, Said 
Heartland Pod is a production of MidMap Media LLC. Producers Adam Summer, Rachel Parker, and Sean Diller. Outro song by American Aquarium, written by BJ Barnum, called The World is on Fire. Learn more about the Heartland Pod at heartlandpod.com. Learn more about American Aquarium at americanaquarium.com. That's when I saw a tear fall from her eyes She said, what are we gonna do? What's this world coming to? For the first time in my whole life I stood there speechless Become the home of the afraid Afraid of the world, afraid of the truth Afraid of each other This ain't the country my grandfather fought for But I still see the hate he fought against Give rest to the tired Give mercy to the poor Give warmth to the huddled masses And I'll show you journey